So Scott Talley here in Houston, Texas with Network in Action and uh, super excited to have you on. Uh, we try to bring pertinent topics every single month that help you grow your business. And I'm super excited about today's topic. Uh, it's a topic that I don't know a lot about and I know enough to know that I need to know more. So I reached out and we were blessed to find a, a, a Moose Rosenfeld, my good buddy and first franchise owner, had a relationship with a genius around crypto. So Moose, I'm going to let you introduce our speaker, if you will. I'm really happy to do that, Scott. Welcome, everybody. Um, I think you're going to be absolutely blown away. Sheldon and I go back to 2010, and he was one of the first guys that I ever knew that was talking about this thing called cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. And um, he he went after it in a big way. And uh, I'm not going to talk any further. Sheldon, welcome. I appreciate you taking time to be on a call today. I think you guys are going to just be blown away. So thank you all. Well, I want to tell everybody first, good afternoon and congratulations for being here. I know there's a lot of other places you could have been today and you chose to be here today. And the subject matter I want to talk about is obviously cryptocurrency. That's what you're here to learn about. But I think sometimes it's understanding the story about how did somebody get to where they're at, perhaps recognized as a subject matter expert. And as entrepreneurs, we all have to understand the importance of books tapes, conferences, educational events, and putting ourselves in the way of the change so that we can capitalize on what that change represents. My good friend, Kyle J. Kemper, wrote a book on the unified wallet. There's another book in the industry. It's called The Bitcoin Standard. Just a few simple books. The key is to understand that the evolution of business industry and technology is something that occurs every moment of every day. It's happening while we're sleeping on this side of the earth. It's happening on the other side of the earth while they're sleeping. And money is the transfer of the value of goods and services. So what I wanna to present to you today is a, a presentation of one of my portfolio companies by the name of CryptoEQ, CryptoEQ.io. And we're gonna start a slide presentation and we can see that what CryptoEQ does is really rather simple. What we do, we make it simple. And how do we make it simple? By providing good quality information. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, Dan's helping me here. This is the new financial infrastructure. And what does this new financial infrastructure look like? We know how computers have impacted telephones through voice over IP, how it's impacted mail through the evolution of what we know is the use case of email. When we look at the evolution of banking and finance, although we have seen this evolution of banks having an internet presence, a way that you can access your records, facilitate doing transactions. But the challenge that we're faced with as business owners is centralized control. You wanna do a transaction with a customer, it's 1 a.m. over here, your bank is closed, they're on the other side of the earth, and it's one o'clock in the afternoon. It would be deemed normal business hours. Money never sleeps. Let's go to the next slide. So we talk about how big is Bitcoin? Bitcoin was created in 2008 in an original document written by a pseudo name by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. Inside of this document, they talked about what's known as the Byzantine general's problem. This is the game that we might play sitting around in a circle, whisper a message into one person's person's ear. It goes around the room through 20 people and comes back and the message does not represent the message that was originally sent. What it does, is it creates what we call a trustless system. It's not to trust less, but to trust less so that we can facilitate sending a message and that message is trusted because it's validated by decentralized nodes, decentralized people that are involved with the transactions through the use of the internet, people running what's commonly known as a miner. They are a node on this network. We're talking about a trillion dollar market 
currently with, uh, it's actually 1 trillion, 39 billion. I just was looking at the records at the moment. The project most people are aware of is known as Bitcoin because Bitcoin was the first use case of the blockchain in the application of store of value. So we talk about the evolution of science, math, digital gold and banking. So Bitcoin is just that. It is the gold as has been recognized in the industry. When we look at this trillion dollar market cap, the second is Ethereum. Ethereum is the development of a smart contract. A smart contract is effectively writing rules that use source data that can make decisions based on the source data. So long as the source data is accurate, the result is accurate. So let's talk about insurance. You buy insurance through an insurance company as a use case for the blockchain and versus what we do in our legacy industries. And in the legacy industry, you have to file a claim. Your house flooded. Like as if the insurance company didn't know your house flooded. You lived in the heart of Meyer land. The National Weather Report showed that the entire area in a FEMA flood map shows exactly what area is flooded. In a use case of a blockchain in a insurance application is it goes out, looks at trusted data, says, yes, they had a claim. Yes, they had a loss. We have an obligation to pay it. So a lot of legacy industry does not want to necessarily embrace it because they realize how it might cannibalize their business. But you and I as consumers, entrepreneurs, and business owners, we're looking at ways of creating a value to our customer that we get rewarded on. But if you have an obligation to pay, you should pay. Financial institutions today want to hold your money. You send a request to send a wire transfer. They tell you at some point down the road, well, we need more information about who this money is going to. But why? You're a knowledgeable, you understand the risk, and you have specific intent on where you want the money to go to. Why should you have a third party intermediary telling you what to do with your money and how to handle your money? This technology is going to change banking, insurance products, medical records, oil and gas royalties, dividends, ownership of a business in a whole different light. I want to move to the next uh, slide. And what we'll see is we're addressing in this presentation here that Bitcoin is the largest uh, crypto in the market with uh, a valuation of about 40% of the market. It is basically the internet of money. It's the world's first source of decentralized blockchain, first uh, unfalsifiable, digitally scarce asset. It's pseudo anonymous. People think this is anonymous. It's actually pseudo anonymous. So although the records are on a public blockchain, it's all available for everybody to read and see. You don't necessarily know who is the party to the transaction as PII. That would be personally identifying information. And it has censorship resistance values. What does this do? This enables a global permissionless peer-to-peer -peer financial settlement system. And we're talking about the use case as a business handling money. And what I want to ask you to do is, I, I'm, I know I'm dumping a lot of information on you today. There's a chat box in the lower right-hand side of this. If you think of something and you come up with a question, I'm going to ask the moderator to... to read those questions and let's try to address those as we move through this because this slide presentation has a lot of information that if you don't have a base understanding it can be a challenge i do um, have one question in the chat here they're asking uh if you have the names of the books and the authors that you showed earlier yes kyle j kemper k-e-m-p-e-r he wrote this particular book the unified wallet and then this bitcoin standard is a very readily accessible book and i have a half a dozen other books as well but the idea is to understand uh 
yeah, that's a good idea. Tiffany suggests just if someone will write that into the chat box, the Bitcoin standard, uh, the unified wallet. And there's blockchain for dummies and Bitcoin for dummies. What is unfalsifiable? That's pretty good. That's where you cannot create a counterfeit transaction. So unlike US dollars, we have counterfeit US dollars. You cannot create a counterfeit crypto transaction because the blockchain works on a system that requires multi-factor authentication, multiple points, audit that information and validate that information. If a node says that's not a valid transaction, transaction will not clear or process. So um, you had touched something uh, on, on something earlier about the trustless systems and you alluded to like Ethereum. And I know that certain blockchains have different capabilities, right? So uh, could you describe the difference between say the Bitcoin and the, or like the Ethereum or, or Chainlink networks? What's going so, on? So what I would do is I would say, let's look at each project as it's, what is its functional utility? Bitcoin's functional utility is a finished project. It's a store of value. And I can transfer that store of value denominated in what's called a Satoshi. That would be uh, one one millionth of a Satoshi. Excuse me, one one hundredth millionth of a Satoshi. When one Satoshi is worth one penny, one Bitcoin will be worth one million dollars. So when I suggested to Moose a number of years ago, 2013 or so, that perhaps he might want to buy a little Bitcoin, and then 2014, he might want to buy a little Bitcoin. We've seen Bitcoin move from $156 on the low side since I've been in the industry for about to about $69,000. So if you look at a yield on that, it's pretty significant. Store of value is people giving it value because of its functional utility to store it. And the underlying utility that it provides as a base cost determined by how much electricity the system uses. So when people say that Bitcoin is mined from thin air, no, the core resource that's the basis of a Bitcoin is the computer systems and the, electron the electricity that's consumed to produce that Bitcoin. That's what they call proof of work, yes? That would be our proof of work systems. Excellent. And, and, um, and on that subject, there was a question that came to me anonymously just now asking about, and I'm sure this would come up eventually, uh, the environmental impact. So um, if you could talk about that with, um, I guess, Bitcoin versus maybe other um, blockchains out there as well. So that, that's a very interesting perspective. That subject matter came up. It reminds me of my history, I'll back up. I built prepaid wireless services, the first prepaid cellular telephone service in North America in 2012, uh, 2000, and, excuse me, 1992, before the 1996 Telecommunication Deregulation Act. And under the premise of consumer protection, cellular telephone companies were advocating that a cell phone, excuse me, telephone companies, legacy industries, were advocating that cellular telephone companies were hazardous to the consumer, using consumer health issues as an argument to prevent the growth of the evolution of wireless technology. Now we're talking about finance and banking and the legacy industries are trying to look for reasons why would we not want to embrace this? Well, number one, it's much more efficient. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it doesn't require any third party moderator, moderator to facilitate the transaction. So the environmental conversation has come out of this strategy of we're all entrepreneurs here. We create an idea. Some people will laugh at us. Then they will fight us and eventually they will join us. So on the premise of they laugh at us and they fight us is this discussion about the environmental impact. In reality, there are a majority of resources producing power that's not being consumed. So to the contrary, proof of work using electricity, surplus power 
is an environmentally responsible use case for this application. We have energy facilities, chemical plants. You drive in Houston, Texas and Baytown, you see all this flare gas being burnt. They have been able to develop in the Ivory Coast in Africa where they take these massive amounts of flare gas that were visible from the satellites and from the moon and capture that gas, run it through a generator, creates electricity that powers the miners, that provides services to the network, all to the benefit of our climate and our environment. So when people wanna challenge the environmental impact, to the contrary, we have major businesses and industries that are consuming massive amounts of electricity to produce their product. And then when those plants go dark, what happens is it creates a load and then reduced load to the network. If these plants and when these plants, which many of these plants are doing here in, in Houston, Texas alone, we have the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, which includes a lot of the major oil and gas electricity companies, looking to be able to take a steady stream of power and keep that steady stream running versus what happens in these windmill uh, generator farms, many times those are shuttered down when the demand goes down, where in fact they could keep those things spinning 24 seven and feed that surplus into the Bitcoin mining facilities. And these mining facilities can be put on and off the grid as the network has surplus power. So hopefully I've addressed that. All right, so there's a, a lot of questions coming in. So I'm gonna leave it up to you if you wanted to um, go down that rabbit hole. I feel like we kind of are derailing a little bit or if you wanted to continue your, your presentation, hopefully some of these get answered or we can um, answer them later on. Did you wanna, what do you wanna do? Uh, what I like to do is let's just move through a few of these slides. Okay. And uh, uh, Bitcoin narratives, well, there's a lot of narratives about how Bitcoin is applied, what its use cases are. I'm going to, uh, uh, we can look at that about electronic cash as a proof of concept, the censorship resistance characteristics, uh, cheap payment network, programmable shared databases, anonymous, uncorrelated to the financial assets, and the reserve currency for crypto. We've seen countries like the likes of Venezuela, who's adopted Bitcoin as an approved currency. And we will see eventually in the US, there will be new currencies created. I want to discuss the traits of money and what are the characteristics of money if we'll go to the next slide. And what we can see in this slide presentation is just talking about fungibility, the ability to interchange it. So gold is pretty fungible, fiat money is fungible, and crypto is highly fungible. And when we talk about consumable, they all have that same characteristic. When we start talking about portability, how can you move the gold? Scott's got the gold in Houston. Moose is sitting over in LA. How are you going to move it? With crypto, simply through the push of a few keys on a computer or a cell phone, you'll be able to functionally move it. It's totally portable. We talk about the durability, fiat money, for all practical purposes, if it goes through a fire, it's gone and it's not usable. We talk about divisible. Well, they are divisible, but they're only divisible to the extent is I have to trade a hundred dollar bill for two fifty dollar bills, and that's a physical functionality. I can't put my fifty dollar bill in my phone and pay my bill. While with crypto, it's highly, highly divisible to one one hundredth million. We talk about security. Well, there's challenges. We see people selling fake gold bars. We see people with counterfeit currency. I personally have been a victim in the real estate business. Someone paid rent with $20 bills to come to find out they were sourced out of Hempstead, Texas, where there was a counterfeit ring going on. And uh, I ended up short because those $20 bills that I took as a value of $20 bills when taken to the bank were basically destroyed as, as paper. We talk about easily uh, transactable. Bitcoin's easily transactable. Cross-border, cross-continent, multi-currency exchangeable. It's an extremely scarce 
with a predictable supply. We don't know how many US dollars are truly in supply. We talk about the sovereignty. Well, it's obviously not tied to a government, so it's low. So it's not got that control. Decentralized, totally decentralized, and it's extremely smart and programmable. So money, as we look at the use case of Bitcoin, is a very functional characteristic and the trait of that. Uh, we look at the M1 money supply. If we'll go to the next screen, um, that's just a whole challenge. We, we don't know how much money is being printed and what the real money supply is. The next screen, we'll see imaging demonstrating Bitcoin as digital gold and uh, the characteristics of stock to flow models. When you start looking at the price, we can move to the next screen. And this is the characteristics of we can see how the dollar's buying power is going down. The crypto buying power is going up. We talk about is that inherent characteristics of inflation, functional utility. The value proposition is that our U.S. dollar, as is all other fiat currencies, those are monies that are produced by a government, those values are going down. That's an inherent functionality the government has interfaced into that fiat money system. And that's this hidden form of taxation. So when we talk about asset preservation, we put our money into things supposedly that are solid hard assets, real estate, gold, you think stocks or bonds, Bitcoin. I personally am heavily weighted in the crypto world as a result of my involvement in the industry since 2013. Let's look at this next one. We were talking about Ethereum and it's the second largest crypto by market cap. It sits at about 20% of the total market cap created by a group of known individuals. Uh, originally, the fellow is a young man, a Russian by the name of Vitalik Buterin and a whole group of other programmers. Uh, Ethereum today is trading at about $1,400, $1,500. When I saw this project in 2014, it was trading at 30 cents. And quite frankly, some of us see new emerging projects and you don't recognize the opportunity. And by the time Ethereum went from 30 cents, it was up to over $3, 10X. And I talked to a couple of my friends and I said, you think this is really functional utility for this technology? And their answers were all yes. It's extremely highly functional, the utility of what we're doing with a smart contract. And so although some of my buddies that didn't know crypto, when I said, yeah, I think I'm going to get in at three bucks, they thought it was a kind of silly idea because I told them about it when I knew about it at 30 cents. And so today it's trading at $1,400. At $3, probably a pretty good move. Most of you wish you to just put, you know, what you might have spent on a nice dinner into Ethereum. But we have to understand that technology and the evolution of technology and the use case of technology sometimes happens in a, in a bubble. We don't really understand what does this mean and how will it impact us. And this is why having the opportunity to participate in the conversation today, if only one objective is occurring today in this conversation and my investment in each and every one of you is for you to recognize this is our future. Regardless of what business or industry you're in, this technology will impact you in some way through your supply chain, directly in your business, to your family and your family's financial future. And I implore you to research and read about and go to YouTube and learn from a credible source. And I reference Crypto EQ. This is, as I said before, this is a portfolio company of some Rice University engineer graduates that we would sit around almost eight, nine years ago talking about these different projects. And the discussion was, this information needs to be made public. And the reason being is the research from CryptoEQ.io is not paid for research. Got an interesting question from uh, Ms. Teresa Strong. She's with Bellinizio. A uh, wonderful organization uh, helps women uh, across Houston uh, with women's shelters. She wants to know, can a, can a nonprofit accept crypto? If so, how? So I think the big question there is the how. I think a lot of people here um, probably uh, need to figure out, like, what, what does it take to actually get a wallet and get some crypto in your wallet? What is a wallet? I think all that could be explained. 
Okay, uh, so the first that, question that's a great question. I, I'm going to actually address that uh, today for sure, but let's hold off on that because I want to move through understanding this Ethereum project and why Ethereum as a fundamental base layer is so critical because it creates what we call decentralized applications. And the ability to create what we call EVM, Ethereum Virtual Machines. And what this does, it enables a decentralized world, computers and per permissionless economy. Let's go to the next uh, slide, please. And its narrative basically is about decentralized applications for the world computer, its utility, what we do is what's called a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. And this subject matter is about how your company, your nonprofit, your for-profit will have a representation in a way that creates a fully auditable platform. Now think about that. If everything you're doing is legitimate, you probably have absolutely no issues with having audits. But if you're doing anything that's questionable, you might not want to have the ability to have your constituents, your customers, your donors have an ability to look at your books. So understand that the evolution of Wall Street is a decentralized autonomous organization and the ability to have open finance and basically radical markets, visions of ether. The next slide we're going to jump to is Ethereum and DeFi. And what is DeFi? This is decentralized finance. This is the separation of centralized finance, the likes of your financial institution that you choose to do business with. We all know the majors, if it's Wells Fargo, Chase, if it's Bank of America, if it's now PNC or any other financial institution. In the application of decentralized finance, we have the ability to effectively do a transaction 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I had the privilege to sit on a investment a board at the Innovation Center here in Houston with Mr. Manolo Sanchez, previous chairman of uh, uh, BBVA Compass, the Spanish bank, multi-billion dollar institution. And the question was asked of him is, what do you see as the most uh, impactful use case for the blockchain? And he said, decentralized finance. And it's very exciting because of what we see happening. If we'll jump into the next uh, screen, we'll see we talk about alternative coins. Alternative coin represents about 40% of the total market cap. 40% is Bitcoin, 20% is Ethereum, and the other 40% is alternative coins and alternative projects. There's currently over 20,000 projects being uh, monitored and reported on at CoinMarketCap. If anybody's taking notes, CoinMarketCap.com gives you the data on each of these projects, gives you access to their white paper, uh, which is effectively their business plan, so you can understand their fundamentals and what the market is doing. We saw $40 billion of value get wiped out just a few uh, weeks ago when Luna, Terra Luna went bust. And it's actually exciting to know that we only saw $40 billion get wiped out because in the evolution of new science and technology and the use of that, there's going to be issues, and it's better those issues happen at 40 billion than at 40 trillion, because that's the evolution of where this market is going. The next start uh, st uh, page I want us to move to it's what's known as stable coins. And what are stable coins? They are just that. I know there's been some questions popping up about the U.S. government talking about issuing a, a U.S. digital dollar, and uh, I'm been privileged to participate in certain conversations on that subject matter, as well as many other countries that are attempting to do that. And uh, the stable coin is just that, it's pegged to a US dollar. So while you have price volatility in the fundamental technology and the use cases of it, as it relates to tech, as it relates to currency, the stable coin creates a stable uh, base for you to be able to avert the extreme price volatility. Let's go over to the next screen and you're gonna see some faces over here. You know, the, this is disruptive and it's often controversial and is extremely misunderstood. And this is something that as entrepreneurs today, 
we want to understand that. So let's take a look at what we determine is the solution. And that is the ability to provide asset research from a reliable source and gain the market insights that you need to grow your own personal portfolio. I highly encourage everybody to have exposure in this asset class. You may not want to be as highly exposed as I am because you don't have the confidence in it yet. And most importantly is you want to have the resources like the Morning Stars or the Bloombergs to be able to help make things readily understandable and easy to use kind of like what Apple's done with their products. When we take a look at what, um, what we're doing over here, we create in Crypto EQ, a very simple app. You can go to the next page. And inside this app, I'm gonna invite you to go to CryptoEQ.io. And there's a, what we call the Bitcoin core report where you can simply take a look through this app at CryptoEQ.io and have the opportunity to see the 50 different uh, top assets that we follow, that we track, that we're actually taking our own data and using it to create a hedge fund because people don't have the time, possibly the inclination or the intestinal fortitude to, excuse me, uh, the intestinal fortitude to uh, stand the ups and the downs when you have these big swings. And just for an example, we have an affiliate company that uh, Crypto EQ has spun out that we're gonna be offering to the public in August. We'll be uh, uh, funding our first round that in our 18 months, we have seen over 800% annualized return. And these types of returns are pretty phenomenal returns. So what I encourage you to do, use the resource of Crypto EQ, look at what the competitive advantages is, how our algorithms are written and how we create proprietary trade secrets that uh, provide trade signals. And I'm gonna ask you to go to the next screen. And this just addresses some of what you might look at. Who's our team? Our team is people that are very knowledgeable in the marketplace and have done phenomenal for their own personal wealth as well as for helping other people. And that's what we want to follow. If you look at the next screen, there's a, a picture there. The top three guys are the fellas that I'm excited to call my business partners, Spencer Randall in the middle and Brooks on the left and Michael on the right. And then several of our other affiliate uh, partners that are pictured. The next page is our co-founders, uh, Spencer and Brooks and Michael. We have a lot of strategic partnerships if we'll go to the next page, um, that are very well versed in the industry. Event Horizon Capital is the hedge fund I just mentioned about in the lower right side. We participate with the Canon, which is an entrepreneurial training center, the Texas Blockchain Council, which advocates for our state uh, legislators to embrace this new emerging industry, to help it to be adopted in Texas so that Texas itself can be one of the leaders in this space because we know that this technology is not sleeping. It's running and operating 24 seven, 365 days. The, uh, the industry itself, it's just about leading research. So if you wanna go to the next page, it uh, talks about Rice alumni owned and operated, our ratings and signals accelerate your investing success and uh, how you should start with crypto EQ. Okay, look at that. They even have a promo code Sheldon. So if you put the promo code in Sheldon, I guess they'll give you some, uh, some incentives to, uh, to uh, join. And it's free to join CryptoEQ.io. So to keep it simple, I'm, it's extremely important that we do that. Um, we've got a 2001 look back report. If you want to take a look at the next uh, screen, we've got over 50,000 active users currently around the world with an extremely high 93% community retention rate. So people start to look at this and read this and learn about this industry and they stick with it. We know in traditional business, a lot of people before they get to profitability have a bad, bad track record of quitting 
right at the cusp of success. Um, the next page, we're just talking about there's more to do 2022. We've got all kinds of reports and training and education that's available. We are connected through all the different resources. Next page, uh, the Facebook, the Twitter, the all the different social media platforms. So everything's available to everybody. Uh, basically, crypto is complex and we make it simple. Now, I want to address use cases. What we do is how does crypto work in the basics? It's about having a wallet. And we discussed earlier about the wallet. What does the wallet do? It's the ability for you to maintain your crypto assets on a computer, on a cell phone, and be able to send and receive. Unlike a credit card, a credit card has two functions. It's got a push and a pull. When you use a credit card as a merchant, you've accepted a payment today, which is basically really a promise to pay by the financial institution through the merchant service processor that you've contracted with. With, unfortunately, financial exposure can be anywhere from 90 to 120 days in the future. And I'm sure many of you entrepreneurs on this uh, discussion here today have experienced that when somebody who came into your place of business presented their business card, did a transaction with you, and then turned around, told their credit card company they didn't authorize it. They then turn around, charge you back, not only the purchase amount, but you've also paid the fees for those products or services, and you have no way necessary to recover those goods and services. By using cryptocurrency and digital payment gateways through a wallet, they are non-reversible, non-transferable, non cancelable transaction, guaranteed payment. When Dell Computer first started accepting Bitcoin, they offered people a 5% discount if they pay with Bitcoin. Why? Just because of that. They could not get scammed on a bad credit card that they shipped a computer to an address. The computer's gone and they're charged back on their credit card. So we're going to talk about how do you accept Bitcoin? You accept it very simple by downloading a wallet. There's the evolution of a new project uh, called, called Codex Vinci, C-O-D-E-X. Vinci, as you know, uh, Leonardo da Vinci created the Codex. And the company is developed through a group called Integral. Integral is a Forex trading platform. Today, it trades $30 billion a day. That's a trillion dollars a month across more than 200 different financial institutions around the world. They, in fact, provide under contract to Visa, they provide Visa all of their international funds, exchange services in the Forex. What is Forex? Simply foreign exchange. Pesos for dollars, dollars for euros, dollars for Canadian dollars. As you travel around the country, assuming we're speaking majority of our audiences here in the U.S., our primary base accounts are denominated in U.S. dollars. But as we travel, there's an exchange rate. And what happens is, is we as the consumer get charged that. Integral charges the financial institution somewhere around $5 a million. That's five bits. While your financial institution earns $2,000 a million. That's 2%. That creates a lot of friction, time delays, and other costs to you as a merchant in receiving your money. The advantage of actually accepting cryptocurrency is the fact that it's real time and nearly immediately. Depending upon which blockchain it's trading across, Bitcoin takes about 10 minutes for a fully confirmed transaction. You can get your first confirmation in less than 60 seconds or thereabouts. And within 10 minutes, six full confirmations, totally non-reversible, non cancelable and the funds can be transferred to anywhere in the world. So in the application of centralized finance, we're at the risk of the financial institution as a central authority. In decentralized finance, we have the opportunity to become our own bank. We control under our personal care custody. And this is a critical element to know in the world of crypto. When you lose your password, to your bank account, you call your bank and say, hey, I lost my password. But if you're using a decentralized financial service 
and you're managing your own wallet and you've lost your password, you've lost access to those assets in that account. So what we call key management, password management is critical on how we store our passwords. People talk about, well, Bitcoin's been hacked for $400 million over here. It's been hacked for $100 million over there. Bitcoin as a blockchain has never been hacked. Centralized exchanges have been hacked. So the central exchange has security breaches. People log in to a central exchange, the likes of a Coinbase, a Kraken, a Gemini, a Bitstamp, these different centralized exchanges that trade in cryptocurrency, if they don't have good security protocol, those assets we have on deposit and those institutions can be put at risk. So on that, so, would, would you advise to steer away from something like Coinbase or Uphold or what have you, Gemini? I, I'm not going to give anybody a personal recommendation, but what I do suggest is we do look at centralized authorities in a centralized exchange as a way to have a conduit to get into the ecosystem. Once you're in the ecosystem, then you can decide how do you want to manage those assets and keep them at, at risk in a centralized authority. I 1000% so agree. So like, if, for example, if, if you got into the crypto space through a service like Coinbase, you could then transfer your crypto to a wallet, manage it there rather than letting um, a service like what of your that, choosing. That's correct. You can move that into a, uh, a secure wallet or cold storage, commonly known as cold storage, take it off your computers outside of a central exchange. And then you can go to anywhere in the world, computer access, you might have what's called a 12 word seed phrase, put the 12 word seed phrase, rehypothecate your wallet and all of the assets are there. Yes, Judy, no password recovery if you are dealing in your own cold storage wallet. And that's important for the consumer to be aware of. As a business owner, it's to your advantage. I want to talk about three ways to get crypto. We get crypto by selling a product or service. We get crypto by providing computer services, commonly known as mining, and solving the puzzles to help secure the, the blockchain. And the third way is buying it. Buy it through an exchange, buy it from a friend or neighbor through a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, person-to-person -person exchange. As a nonprofit or as a business owner, it's certainly to your advantage to provide those goods and services and be willing to accept crypto. As a nonprofit, as a nonprofit, the advantage of you as a 501c3 is the idea that there are individuals out there that have amassed uber wealth through the price appreciation of the crypto and advocating to that community the idea that they can make a donation to a worthy organization that accepts their crypto, they can write that donation off at the now current fair market value, regardless of what their basis was and get the tax advantage of making a donation. So I'm a strong advocate encouraging nonprofits to look at and embrace the idea of accepting crypto as a form of fundraising for your initiative. And at that point, once you have accepted the crypto, you have the opportunity in your wallet, specifically in the Vinci wallet. Uh, uh, Codex Vinci, the wallet that's being released, provides the ability to convert into multiple different currencies. And we talked about stable coins and the price volatility exposure in the traditional markets versus the stable coins. So you can take your volatile asset, the likes of Bitcoin, because your donor may have amassed a significant price appreciating the Bitcoin, he does not want to convert that to a dollar because if he converts that to a dollar, he's got the tax implications of those gains. While leaving it in its original form factor as Bitcoin and making that donation, you as the nonprofit can certainly turn around then, lock in its price value, convert it to a stable coin, 
and keep it on your books as a stable coin. Now, if the initiative of the nonprofit is such that you're allowed to hold assets that have price volatility potential, I would highly recommend that you hold on to it. Right now, the market is down. Any of us and every one of us on this phone call understand the state of the global economy and what's going on. So it's critical to understand when things are on sell, that's when we buy. When things are at the top of the market, that's when we sell. When they're low, that's when we buy. Right now, so I might have said that backwards, but just for clarity, the market is down, we're buying and accumulating. The market goes to full retail and gets up higher. We can sell and lock in our profit if we so choose to. So people ask me like, is now a time to buy the market so far down? Well, if we use a simple philosophy known as DCA defined as dollar cost averaging, and you're investing $100 or $1,000 a week, you get twice as much when the price is down. So we buy while things are on sale. Whoever made that comment, thank you. And so that's what I encourage you to do is to buy while it's on sale. And most importantly, I advocate the fact that timing the market is a very challenging objective. And I, I personally, being in the market for as many years as I, I'm in, I advocate it's time in the market. Be steady, be willing to ride the price volatility, it's gonna go down and it will seesaw back up. I'd like to, uh, I see that we have, we're getting uh, almost to the top of the hour. We've got about 10, 12 minutes. I'd like to go to the chat. Uh, yes. Dan, do you want to look at the chat and look Dan, at the Dan, start with questions? the very first question, if you will, at the very top. And let's work our way down as many of them as we can. We've got seven or eight. All right, cool. Let me get there. <clears throat> okay. The environmental impact. Okay. How is the blockchain? Okay. How is the blockchain the first method where an oil, an oil company can tra uh, track a tanker from the North Sea to the Houston Ship Channel? I'm not sure if I understand that. How is the blockchain the first method where an oil company can track a tanker from the North Sea to the Houston Ship Channel? Well, I would say, I mean, I'm not sure about the first method, but in as a use case, uh, using geolocation tracking, you can then turn around and record that data directly to the blockchain. The blockchain is a public record, and they can then see through geolocation tracking the, the location, the physical location of where that tanker is. From Catherine, what industries are taking payment via Bitcoin or a competitor today? Uh, well, we're seeing the likes of travel agencies or some travel services that are accepting Bitcoin. There's some 60 plus thousand different businesses, independent, privately owned businesses, and a lot of online businesses. Um, the, the, the likes of multiple restaurants, if you want to use the uh, app, uh, I think it's called Coin Tracker, and in the app Coin Tracker, I believe it is, you can see who accepts Bitcoin, and uh, you can put in your zip code and see exactly what businesses in your area is are participating currently. I tell you, a lot of sites as well are, are starting to embrace the idea of accepting Bitcoin. I'm seeing more and more plugins and extensions for enabling that as a payment gateway. Um, yep. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, All right. BitPay, uh, BitPay is one of the companies that provides merchant services. Yes, yes. All right, um, so from Linda, if we all start using this, how do we use it to control countries like Iran and weapons and drug dealers? That's a big one. Well, let's, uh, let's agree first thing that the American US dollar is the number one currency on planet Earth that's currently using for, used for illegal and illicit transactions, first. Secondly, the blockchain is an immutable record. So what happens is, is you can track, there's a project uh, being developed right now called Phantom X. Phantom X is a tracking tool. You put in someone's wallet address and you can see if that wallet address has been flagged for being used in any illegal, illicit, or nefarious transactions, so that under the guidance of FinCEN, it's called the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, 
that you're not going to be complicit in any kind of illegal, illicit, sanctioned type of activities. So to answer that question, it's simply it's public record information. I have a question for you. So um, it seems, I mean, you seem like a really great cheerleader for, for crypto. Would you say philosophically you're more um, uh, in, the, in the realm of this as an investment opportunity or as like in a, an actual form of, you know, just transacting if you wanted to buy a shirt, say, and just the, the utility of it? So there's two sides to the, in, in that regard to your question is how I'm seeing it. So as full disclosure, I am an advocate for the functional utility and the use case as the global payment network. Right on. And by understanding the use case as a global payment network, then you have to look at it from an entrepreneurial perspective and investment perspective and say, do I want to participate in the evolution of this technology? All of us, I'm assuming, are old enough on this phone, on this uh, call, have seen a pager. We've seen possibly a bag phone. We've seen a brick phone. And today we see a little micro device we call cell phones. And had we been smart enough early on to take a stake in some of these companies while we were using the technology, you'd be far further ahead financially. And I've chosen to participate on both sides of this industry. I got some um, interesting questions here. Some Illuminati questions. All right. Is Bitcoin intended to be the one world currency? No, I already told, I already said earlier, Bitcoin's functional utility is a store of value. So the currency, you got to remember, a store of value asset has price volatility exposure. So while you might buy a gold bar or a piece of real estate to store the value, that is not what you're going to use as the form of daily currency. You're going to use something that's stable. So Bitcoin is a project, is not the one world currency. Okay. Um, all right. So with DeFi, there are no securities backing the crypto and there is nothing tangible. So how do we hedge the risk? Uh, did you hear me there, Sheldon? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think about how you asked the question. Um, so the first thing that. is, there is, there are assets, digital assets that are going to be and that are asset backed. So I'm going to address one project specifically I'm thinking of is called ICE. ICE is the digitalization of diamonds. So as a security that happens to be used in a decentralized finance use case is backed by that diamond. And that crypto asset, commonly known as an NFT, a non-fungible token, which we haven't discussed, is redeemable for that diamond. All right. Um, interesting question here. I haven't thought about this one. Uh, do you have thoughts on MLM, multi-level marketing companies that promote crypto? Uh, most of them, with all due respect, are... Pump and dump. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, folks, but I'm just going to say it the way I think it. They're crap. All right. They're, they're just crap. I, I have seen and I've had friends that used our network to buy cryptocurrency, to participate in MLMs that were nothing more than a pure scam, pyramid scheme. All right, and so on that, um, how, do you, how do you go about discerning what might be a good op uh, investment opportunity and you know, others that are just, because there's so many different, so many different altcoins out there. And um, it's so easy to get caught up when people are excited. You see this on YouTube and, you know, they're like, invest, buy, 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 buy. It's, it's, it's nothing right now. And then, you know, it just crashes. So how do you, what is your process? How do you discern uh, what's a good investment opportunity and what might not be? So I am a bit angel. I'm blessed to have been in the business for a long time. And the reason that I invested in crypto EQ is because I've had many of my friends lose a significant amount of their money getting into one of these 
schemes, one of these pumps and dumps. There's over 20,000. Today, I'm looking, there's 20,374 projects being reported on by coin market cap. How can you discern, how can you decipher through and come to those conclusions as an amateur, you can't. So what you wanna do is you wanna have a resource that has a team of people that are not paid by the project, that are not using or doing this for duplicitous purposes. They're doing it purely on the fundamental basis of providing information that you can make educated trading signals on. We talk about all the time, the most important thing is D-Y-O-R. You can write that down, D-Y-O-R. Do your own research. If you're not paying attention, I guarantee you someone's gonna to wanna to do a wallectomy on you. And nope. that wallectomy is the surgical remover of, removal of your wallet from your butt. And they're gonna to try to get to your money. So you've got to use prudent care. My fundamental thesis that I look at when I'm investing in new projects is three pronged, three legged stool. Fundamentals, who are the people? What is the product uh, problem that they're addressing? And what is the total value, the TAM, the total adjustable market value? If I got a good quality team of people with a very clearly identifiable problem that they're looking to address that has a significant total adjustable market, there's a high probability of success. Is it guaranteed? There is no guarantees of success. Each and every one of us as true entrepreneurs have had winners and we've had failures. But what we've recognized is what didn't work, we moved away from. And what does work, that's what we continue to pursue. Right on. Um, all right, there was one question here and uh, basically it was um, on the seed phrase, right? They are worried about losing their password. What is a good seed phrase management system that you would recommend? Uh, well, there's, there's uh, a variety of different strategies. Most importantly is, that you write the seed phrase down in yeah. a secure place, you have multiple copies of it and secure them in multiple locations. And then there's different types of, uh, there's something called a, a bill foddle. It's a steel plate that you put the letters in with your seed phrase in it, close it up, put a padlock on it and it's fire resistant, it's rain and water resistant. And so take one of those uh, bill foddles and put that in your safety deposit box Take another one, lock it up, put it in another secure location. Multi-location seed phrase management is critical. Um, I got one for you. So there's all types of wallets out there. Um, the, the folks are asking, um, Teresa had asked if, uh, if it's free to get a wallet. Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, I, I have one. It's called MetaMask, right? And it's um, yes. based on the web. Do you have any thoughts on the security of something that uh, integrates with your browser? Yeah, I mean, a MetaMask is a secure, it's a uh, Ethereum-based EVM uh, wallet, very good wallet. I like, uh, Paul Pewey wrote the code for a wallet called Edge Wallet. It's also a decentralized wallet, and the Edge Wallet is a cool wallet. And the Vinci Wallet will be, when Vinci Wallet is fully released here in this next quarter, it is a fully functional, stable coin interchangeable Forex wallet. So you'll be able to bring in uh, Bitcoin, you'll be able to bring in Ethereum, you trade it for pesos, for euros, for dollars. So in the world of, and I'm gonna talk about a use case for the Vinci wallet because the subject matter of MLMs came up. The In the MLM industry, there are millions and millions of distributors globally working for companies that are denominated in a primary core currency. So Amway has headquarters in Ada, Michigan, but they've got distributors around the world. Herbalife based out of California. They've got operations all around the world. And the payment networks through the use case of using something like a Vinci wallet, they are able, the corporate entity can pay their distributors using a Vinci wallet denominated in the US dollars that their then distributors can turn around and convert it to any other currency that they choose to. And then as we see more and more global adoption of cryptocurrencies, they'll be able to then use that in their communities 
to be able to conduct business or doing online transactions. You've all been reading about crypto in the financial space, the likes of what JP Morgan Chase is now talking about. Fidelity is now offering you the opportunity to buy Bitcoin inside of your 401ks. And there's going to be many other major financial institutions that are going to start to embrace this because although they laughed about it and called it stupid just a few short numbers of years ago, as I reminded you as entrepreneurs, you know, people laugh at us about our ideas. Then they fight us that they don't want it to, to affect their business, their legacy industry. And then eventually what they do is they're going to join us. And this is the phase that we see starting to happen. All right, I got a question from Rachel Redline. If I set up my business to accept cryptocurrency and I sell something for $100 and it stays in my wallet for 10 years, do I still have $100 or do I lose or gain based on the quote unquote stock market? Okay, well, since it's not tied to the stock market, but it is tied yeah. to the crypto market, <laughs> yes. if you accept a token that is volatile, not a stable coin, you are subject to market price volatility risk. If you denominate it in a stable coin, it's just that it's a stable coin. But let's all acknowledge a dollar a hundred years ago does not have the same trading value for goods and services as it does today, even though it's still a dollar. All right. Um, let me see here. So from Karen, we put my money in an online wallet and the wallet disappeared along with our money. Have you ever heard of that happening? Yeah, of course. Um, let me see from Rob Johnson. How can we reconcile using Bitcoin or other crypto as currency given the price and stability versus US fiat? Seems to me that it may be, so obviously there's still some stigmas here. It seems to me that there may be a better, um, may be better as software technology investment rather than currency. What do you think? I could guess what you uh, think. Well, I, 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 in full disclosure, I do not invest in stable coins because that's not a investment. That's just a strategy on how to hold your current currencies and acknowledging that inflation at the tune of eight, nine percent, your dollar is soon only worth 92 cents. And shortly thereafter, it will be worth some number less than that. So if you're looking for a hedge against inflation, you put that into a project, a business, a group of people that are solving a clear and obvious problem that has a significant total addressable market that has the opportunity for price appreciation. So at some point, your dollar in the future is worth $1.20 or $2, or in my case, my $3 is now worth $1,400. Right on. All right. Um, so that does it with the questions for now. Does anybody have anything else? Feel free to unmute, chime in. Otherwise, we're going to start winding this down. Oh, uh, Scott, you're on mute there, buddy. Yeldon, thank you. Just fantastic information. I don't know if the rest of you are like me, but almost can't wait to get home and get dinner behind me so I can get on the internet and do some research. You've created a, a, a task, a, a to do list for me that's going to take some time, but that's exactly what I needed. <laughs> Uh, I really appreciate it. Any, any last minute questions before we jump off? Um, I got one. So and I might be opening a whole can of worms here, but we had spoken briefly about NFTs. Um, what are your thoughts on these things? Uh, well, yes. NFT is a non-functional, non-fungible token. What does that mean? Effectively, let's just say it represents ownership in a single asset that's not currently divisible. So the idea that we can take a piece of real estate that we've been buying title insurance on every time it's traded hands, for what benefit? The title insurance company. In this case, with the chain of title is traceable, trackable, and verifiable on a blockchain. And the key to the NFT is basically evidence of ownership of the asset that's represented by that. Do I believe in NFTs? It is definitely our future, and there are many, many use cases that are very functional, practical, that we're going to see being adopted. Excellent. I want to tell you guys, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you for your time and your attention, and just realize 
this is an industry that's going to happen with us. It's going to happen without us. And the most exciting opportunity is you now know about it. So you can never tell your friend's family or anybody in the future that you never heard about cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. Now it's in your hands to decide if you're going to embrace it and have it become a part of your financial portfolio. And all I could say is I truly encourage you to do that. Thank you guys for the opportunity today. Sheldon, great job, buddy. Really appreciate it. Thank Thank you all for joining us. Look forward to seeing you on Network with the Nation the first Wednesday of every month at the same time, three o'clock central, the third Wednesday of every month for Sales Mastery, and the fourth Wednesday of every month for our speaker series. Thanks very much for your support of Network in Action. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Thanks, guys. guys.